Someone came to see me in my office and said, listen, there's a superior who wants to see you urgently. Who's looking for me, I asked. The department deputy chief, he said. I think to myself, my God, the deputy chief, the top general. Why is he interested in me? They began talking, beating around the bush. And I said, why don't you come out and ask what you want? What do you want from me exactly? They said, okay, we're conducting an internal investigation on you and we'd like to ask you a few questions. Please go ahead, I said. But to talk, they took me to Lefortovo prison. They put me into solitary confinement for three days so that I could think things over, they said. Then they started to accuse me on specifics. You've done this, you've done that, you warned this person and that person, you did this, you did that. I started to add up articles of the penal code in my head. At one point I thought, thank God I won't be shot. <laughs> Many of the KGB spies who went to the West became double agents. But there's only one case of an officer in charge of repressing dissidents who risked his life by joining their struggle for freedom. Viktor Orikov is unique in the history of the Soviet Union. For two years he protected dozens of dissidents, often without their knowledge. I went to Moscow to investigate his past and talk to dissidents and former members of the KGB. Viktor Orikov left Russia leaving no trace or any possibility of returning home. After months of investigation in Moscow, Kiev, Ankara, New York and Los Angeles, I find Viktor Orikov in the United States where he lives an anonymous life, no identity, no telephone. Cut off from the world, without contact from family or friends, this man with an exceptional destiny has told his story to no one. For the first time since he left Russia and after long reflection, Viktor Orikov agrees to break years of forced silence, to leave his mark on history. I didn't end up in the KGB by chance. I was raised in a family loyal to the Soviet state, its socialist ideals, and the Communist Party. That's why, when I finished my military service, I was considered as someone reliable, serious, and I was sent to the border guards. In the army, I was prepared to sit for examinations to enter the Kiev Polytechnic. Seeing that I was a serious student, my superior decided to send me to study at the KGB Institute. I began by studying Turkish culture and language, but also law and especially techniques in intelligence and counterintelligence, everything that was top secret. To be accepted into the prestigious KGB Academy is an honor, a privilege you don't refuse. This is where future spies are trained and sent to Soviet embassies in the four corners of the world. Others, like Viktor Orikov, remain in Moscow, where they'll be in charge of ideological control. I was extremely proud to find myself among KGB agents, as any young man would have been at the time. I knew that my work would involve great responsibility and that I would be part of the elite. Why do I say this? Everyone knew that the KGB was more important than any other state institution. Uh, 
In 1970s Russia, the Soviets no longer believe in building a socialist Eden. The USSR is not the paradise it pretends to be. Its leaders are aging and its economy is in decline. At official ceremonies, everyone proclaims their faith and loyalty to the Communist Party. But not far from the crowds, growing dissident movements are severely punished by the KGB. There's growing unrest. Threats to the system not only come from the West, but also from within. The USSR's party first secretary, Leonid Brezhnev, and the party central committee are worried about the regime's survival. KGB director Yuri Andropov responds by creating the fifth department in charge of surveillance and the repression of dissidents. At the time, Colonel Igor Prelin was an agent working in counterintelligence. Sam Andropov, будучи председателем КГБ, Yuri Andropov, the KGB's director, in an internal document sent to the Party Central Committee, estimated that the number of dissatisfied or hostile people towards the Soviet system to be 8.5 million. In absolute terms, this is an important figure. Eight and a half million people. It represents the population of a small European state. It was out of the question for Soviet authorities to allow the dissidents to have a voice. Viktor Orikov and his colleagues at the KGB monitor the protesters' every move, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Author of a major work on the KGB's history, Evgenia Albats was one of the first to encounter Captain Orikov and consult his file. Orikov was a loyal and accomplished Soviet. He was convinced that the Soviet system was perfect, the best in the world. He worked in the fifth department and knew its advantages. He could enter a minister's office whenever he liked. It was true everyone was afraid of the KGB. No one knew what bad things they would do to you, block your career or stop you from going abroad. KGB agents who worked in the fifth department had the right to read forbidden literature for research, such as Solzhenitsyn or Orwell, the author of 1984 and Animal Farm. It was while reading Solzhenitsyn that Orikov was deeply shocked. This literature could have a strong impression on people who questioned and thought about things. I think that at the time I had reached a certain maturity, I could reflect on things. And naturally, these books had a great influence on me. In particular, the Gulag Archipelago. I was very proud to be the first in the Soviet Union to read the last volume of this book. Reading it, you felt the extent of the violence the Communist Party exercised on its people. These books showed how our country was under heavy totalitarian rule. It was as if people were imprisoned. That was the feeling it left me with. Russian people begin to feel a need to open up to the outside world. They become aware of the system's failures and view their leaders with increasing contempt. The KGB, as the armed wing of the Soviet system, is seen as evil. This starts to play heavily on Orikov's mind. He begins to ask questions. Should we punish young people searching for knowledge? He's deeply touched by them, whether they're dissidents or simply curious, anyone who takes risks to read forbidden literature. 
Viktor Orikov begins to falsify his reports. You think you have a useful role in society, but at the same time you're aware of the horrible things you do. This weighed heavily on my mind. For example, one day two young girls of the Komsomol were prosecuted for having read a book by Amerik entitled Will the Soviet Union Survive Until 1984? It wasn't very serious, but for this minor offense, they could have been excluded from the Young Communist League, kicked out of the Komsomol, and lose their jobs at the Weather Bureau. This is what would have happened if I'd acted like a true KGB agent, but I refused to wreck their lives. I wanted to be more measured when dealing with these kinds of offenses. Also, I didn't want people to think that the KGB was an organization that shattered people's lives without a reason. So I explained how they should answer the accusations and wrote the deposition with them. They had to pretend that they bought the book by accident, instead of a thriller or a romance that they wanted to buy at the Dietsky Mir black market. I told them to say that someone had swapped this anti-Soviet book with the one they thought they had bought. They only discovered it when they arrived at work, and of course, it was too late to return it. Of course, they never read it or talked to anyone about it. How the KGB found out about the book, I don't know. Someone probably denounced them. I talked to the girls and I made a false report so that the matter would be dismissed, be archived. From the mid-60s, Pushkin Square became a meeting place for dissidents. The first demonstration took place on December the 5th, 1967, the anniversary of the Constitution. At night, the dissidents gathered here. They demonstrated in silence. There were no placards. No chanting. It was a silent demonstration in honor of those who died in the gulags and those who were imprisoned. Since then, there have been demonstrations each year on the 5th of December at 6 p.m. At first, there were about 10 people. By the mid-70s, it was in the hundreds. The place was packed. But we have to admit that among the crowd, there were a lot of KGB agents. Militiamen also surrounded and monitored the area to stop the dissidents from coming to the square. Among his assignments, Captain Orikov is put in charge of Alexander Gotovsev Rosiski, a dissident who distributes anti-Soviet leaflets and never misses an event at Pushkin Square. Each 5th and 10th of December, as a kind of tradition, I regularly went to Pushkin Square. First, I had to reach the square. The KGB wouldn't let us pass and caught many of us before we arrived. The trick was to be there at exactly the right moment in order to remove our hats or chapka as a sign of protest. When we did, the cops and KGB agents immediately jumped on us. On that day, the famous dissident Andrei Sakharov gave a speech at Pushkin Square. There was a lot of mud because rain had melted the snow. Some of my colleagues put the muddy snow in plastic bags and threw them at Sakharov to make it look as if the crowd was upset. The dissidents beside him formed a barricade and started fighting with us a little, but we managed to push them away with the help of other agents. There were many agents there that day. The guy who threw the mud lost his chapka in the fight, so his superior bought him a new mink one from the KGB store. Later, he wouldn't stop boasting that he was given a real mink chapka because he threw snow at Sakharov. 
и меня поймали еще далеко до подходов. I was once caught before arriving at the square and forced into a taxi. They used taxis to get rid of people. Later, with perestroika, I became a free man. I finally got the freedom I always wanted. But even today, each time I take a taxi, I'm very tense and stressed. In totalitarian countries, in closed societies, the authorities never know what they should be afraid of. The dissident movement was very small, but the authorities couldn't ignore it. It was very difficult to know and assess to what point the dissidents succeeded with the general population. Did their petitions and their speeches have any resonance? Did their protests have support from the general public? Did they join? Because of these unanswered questions, the KGB worked to exterminate these movements before they took root. Faced with this situation, the party central committee and the head of the KGB orders the 5th department to remove dissident figureheads. The writer Alexander Solzhenitsyn is evicted from the Soviet Union. Orekov and his colleagues take turns monitoring Andrei Sakharov around the clock. The authorities want to regain control of the population with an iron fist. For General Bobkov, director of the 5th Department, the primary objective is to protect the regime from the West. When they say that we were fighting against the dissidents, they are saying something completely false, because we never fought against people who thought differently to us. But there were people in the Soviet Union who came into contact with foreign intelligence services and with anti-Soviet organizations based in the West. And these people worked to undermine our constitutional order. They were fighting against authority. And when the Fifth Department took action against the dissidents, it was to defend them, to save them. The West began to protest, saying that we were persecuting the dissidents. General Bobkov, like his superior Yuri Andropov, considers the dissidents to be mentally ill. Besides arrests, imprisonment and the gulags, the authorities use psychiatric hospitals as a political weapon. The method is simple, to declare those who think differently as insane. The treatment used on the dissidents includes torture, leaving them scarred for life. The decision whether to commit people or not was up to the KGB's 5th Department. If the 5th Department had not been created in 1967, and if we had done nothing, then the disintegration of the Soviet Union would have started much earlier. The 5th Department delayed the end of the USSR by 20 years. The Soviet Union has a paradoxical way of rewarding its people. The best officers, those who achieve the best grades, are sometimes given a trip to capitalist hell. In 1973, Viktor Orikov is sent on a mission to Japan. The KGB had a reward system for their best officers. It was to send them abroad. I was sent with the Bolshoi Ballet and Theatre Company to Japan. They went there each year for two and a half months during the summer. They had a contract with a major Japanese TV station. We were sent as guardians. 
observers, you could say. As KGB agents, we were sent to monitor the performers. I saw nothing of what our propaganda was saying, that there was poverty everywhere, apart from a few very rich people. I never saw queues in Japan. You could go to a store, buy what you wanted and go home. But in our country, everyone suffered from shortages. There was nothing on shelves, and the queues were intolerable. We could see that Japanese people weren't living the life that we had in the Soviet Union or what was being portrayed by our media. This meant that the information we got at home was exactly the opposite of the truth, completely wrong. Back from Japan, Captain Viktor Orokov is assigned new cases. Among them is a computer scientist known for distributing banned literature. His name, Mark Morozov. I received reports so that I could verify the risk posed by a number of people. They were isolated dissidents who openly protested against the government. Among the reports was a file on Morozov, I tried to gain his confidence, but this was mostly to get hold of banned literature that I was interested in. My superiors insisted that I recruit him and turn him into a KGB informant in order to obtain information on his relationships. I was sure that we weren't going to turn him into an informant. He was the sort of person who could accidentally give us information, but I was sure he wouldn't cooperate with the KGB. I borrowed some of his banned books, those that I would normally confiscate. What we should have done is the following. Search his home and confiscate everything which would be enough to put him in prison for a very long time. He began to trust me, and I said to him, as an honest man, I give you my word that I will return these books and not mention this to anyone. What happened to Grigorenko was devastating. I heard Grigorenko's radio interview while I was at Morozov's home. During the interview, he cried in deep pain and said, But what have I done to be deprived of my motherland and the possibility of being buried in my country? Hearing a general of his stature cry like this, one who had always served his country, was a great psychological shock. How could our government treat our heroes like this, those who defended our country during the war? At this point, I asked myself, but whom did I vow to serve and give my loyalty to? All of this was adding up in my mind. I could see exactly what was going on. I saw the documents that were prepared, the ones to take away his Soviet citizenship well before his departure. And even to the last, I continued to hope, maybe he could still return home. Suddenly I hear, following Grigorenko's anti-Soviet activities while overseas, and due to the fact that he spread anti-Soviet propaganda abroad, we've decided to deprive him of Soviet citizenship. Signed, the Supreme Presidium of the USSR. 
For me, that was the last straw. It was then I realized that I had no place in this organization. I had to go. But you can't leave the KGB just like that, it's impossible. There was another option. I could help those unfortunate people who suffered for nothing. They suffered because of their views on life, just because they wanted to change society and make it more humane. They wanted to rid society of slavery, because it was a system of slavery under police surveillance, a real police state. From now on, Orekov's wish to do the right thing overrides any concerns for his own safety. He sees no future for a Soviet society based on fear and lies. He supports the dissidents' ideals and decides to help them, fully aware of the risks and without any illusion about the eventual outcome. I would pick a phone number, knowing that it was under surveillance. I then went to a phone booth and calmly called, talking with a handkerchief over the mouthpiece to disguise my voice and avoid any possible inquiry at a later date. I'd say, this is a warning, tomorrow you will be searched. Or, your phone is tapped, but not that of such and such. Or, you must notify your friends and tell them to get rid of the contraband literature. That's what I was doing. Ludmila Alexieva is a very active dissident and one of the first to receive an anonymous call from Orikov. One day, someone I didn't know phoned me. I couldn't tell from the voice whether it was a man or woman because they were disguising it. They spoke with an aging voice. Tomorrow, you will have a pest control treatment. I replied, what pest control? I didn't ask for one. And they said, think about it. Tomorrow, you will have a pest control. I said, I don't understand. I didn't ask for a pest control. I don't have rats. I don't have cockroaches. They continued, but listen to me carefully. I hung up thinking it was a joke. Next morning they came to search my home. I didn't know who called me, but it was then that I realized that someone tried to warn me. It was a bizarre situation. You know, when they did a search, first they collected the documents, books, audio tapes. They sorted them, putting the things that interested them in one pile, and what didn't interest them in another. As the search continued, the piles grew, but one pile grew faster than the other. I looked and I noticed that one of the KGB agents was not doing what he should be. I knew that certain documents could be of interest to their investigation, but he put them in the pile that was of no interest. I started taking things and classified them in two different piles. I found something that interested us, I flicked through it, and I saw that it was exactly what we wanted. It was why we came here to search. First of all, I put it on the pile that didn't interest us. I then picked it up again, and I gave it to him. I told him, this, put it where you want, it doesn't interest us. <laughs> he looked at me strangely, as if he couldn't believe his eyes and ears. I was really surprised. I thought to myself, this guy is crazy. Maybe he's not really a KGB agent. Or he's just young and incompetent. Years later, Orekov told me 
that he did it deliberately because some documents could be dangerous. So, he put them in the pile that was of no interest to the KGB. On the pretext of trying to recruit Mark Morozov as a KGB informant, Viktor Orikov meets him to pass information on to the dissidents. A complicity forms between the two men. Mark Morozov often came to my home. He was very friendly, always willing to help others. However, he didn't appear to be someone you could fully trust or you could count on. He began to tell me about a KGB agent who, during the whole interrogation, said that he supported the dissidents and that he would like to help them. Morozov suggested that he would come to his place for tea. He asked me if I wanted to come and meet the KGB officer. I said, definitely not. And added, Mark, I ask you, no, I insist that you give up this idea. You can't let him into your home. The first time I saw Orikov was at Morozov's apartment. We were in the neighborhood with his daughter, so we decided to pay him an impromptu visit. There were always dissidents at Morozov's home. It was a real refuge. But this time it was empty. We thought he was alone. Morozov was very embarrassed when we entered the kitchen. We saw that he wasn't alone. He didn't introduce us. Orikov was also very uneasy to see us. We could see that they were having a confidential discussion. To ease the atmosphere, we said that we were just passing through, that we were in a hurry, and we left. We would meet on official terms. We had a file on him, saying that he was a potential recruit, and I had to try and persuade him to cooperate with the KGB. So I had the right to meet him formally. Each time I met him, I made out a report. On each visit, I would bring a tape recorder. But before I turned it on, I warned him, from now on, anything you say will be recorded. I also received information from bug departments or from office colleagues who gave me information. I would ask them, as we often did, so, these dissidents, did they meet in this apartment? They would say, yes, they spoke to embassy people, foreign correspondents. So, based on information from the KGB, I could write a report on Morozov as if it was him who gave me the information without harming anyone. A few days later, he came to my house and said that the KGB agent came to his apartment for tea and had a very interesting discussion. And I said to him, Mark, I asked you not to see him in your home. You promised me that you would refuse to see him, but you went and did it anyway. Forgive me, but from now on, I have to ask you to never come to my apartment again. I had no chance with other dissidents. I knew they wouldn't trust me. I knew much less about them than I did of Morozov. Besides, other KGB agents were assigned to their cases. What could I do? Go see them and say, Hi, I'm from the KGB and I want to help you? And then what? It would have come out immediately, and the KGB would instantly know that one of their agents went to see these dissidents offering help. So I couldn't help them. It would have blown my cover.
Viktor Orokov is under no illusion. He knows that the dissidents could not keep this secret for long and that their negligence would eventually prove fatal. But there was no going back. Eta sudba, as they say in Russian, it's destiny, the die is cast. He started giving information on KGB activities using the dissident Mark Moradzov as a go-between. The information was on upcoming raids, on arrests or wiretaps. They had code names, T for Tatiana, an S for Sergei. Tatiana meant an apartment was bugged, and Sergei, a phone was tapped. As a KGB officer, he knew all about ongoing operations. He knew who was being watched, where they were put listening devices, and what the KGB was planning. Morozov was often in a hurry to give out information. This is despite knowing that the phones of so-and-so were tapped. He sometimes called them and said, you know, I have a guy from the KGB who gives me this information. And you know, there will be such and such a thing or, you know, your apartment is tapped. I would say to him, Instead of calling, go and see him personally and whisper quietly and carefully in his ear. While Orikov was working through Morozov, Morozov told all his friends. The dissidents gave him the nickname Klitushnikov. What followed was a tragic comedy, which went a little like this. At Skirsky's home, for example, Morozov arrives and warns him that he will be searched. Skirsky asks, how can you know? Morozov replies, I have an insider in the KGB who told me. His name is Kletushnikov. And then Skirsky reminds him, shh, there are microphones everywhere, they're listening. I knew that everyone was under close surveillance, but the dissidents thought it was only a small operation for one person or a maximum of ten people. They couldn't imagine what our organization, the KGB, was like. From time to time, I would call the wiretapping service and say, Hi girls, what's new? One day they said, Someone phoned and warned that there'll be searches. I reply, That's impossible. We absolutely have to know who's doing this. Start an investigation to find out who it is. It was a dangerous game. Every day, Captain Orokov takes more and more risks to pass on information and protect the dissidents. Because Morozov's apartment is bugged, the KGB know that he's receiving information from one of their agents. Mark Morozov is arrested and imprisoned at Lefortovo. After intensive interrogation, the KGB finally get him to confess. As often happens, prison reveals a person's true nature. Prison is like an X-ray that strips people to what they really are. Mark Morozov didn't pass the test. He broke down and confessed everything. He denounced and betrayed Orikov. He was the only witness to be used against him. Knowing how the KGB works, 
and how the dissidents used the information provided by Morozov, I doubted that this would last a long time. For example, just before my arrest, I realized that I was followed by the surveillance service. I knew who they were because I worked with them before. We began to have suspicions, as always happens in these types of cases. When there are leaks, an internal investigation takes place. We established Orekov's involvement. He was arrested and sentenced to the Gulag for eight years. What they learned about my activities was enough to get them very angry. But legally, the charges against me didn't match any article of the Soviet Union's criminal code. This is how the verdict went. Disclosure of Operation T. Top secret. Disclosure of Operation M. Top secret. While Mark Morozov testifies against Viktor Orekov, Orekov refuses to denounce his accomplice. He even tries to clear Morozov's name when asked to testify in court. My second encounter with Orekov was just as surprising as the first. It was at my stepfather's trial, Mark Morozov, in 1979 in Moscow. I managed to enter the courtroom. There were only plain-clothed KGB agents dressed as members of the general public. They stood out, not just by how they were dressed, but also by their behavior. They were there to look like ordinary people. I didn't feel comfortable at all. I walked out to escape the heavy atmosphere. I went to the courtyard for air and smoke a cigarette. At that moment, a police van pulled up at the entrance and two guards took out a prisoner. I immediately recognized him as the KGB captain that I met at my stepfather's house. We caught each other's gaze, our eyes fixed for a long time. He kept his eyes on mine while he and the guards made their way to the courtroom. I remember it as if it was yesterday, his piercing stare. When I think back to that moment, his gaze, I wonder why did this man do all the things he did? While he was awaiting judgment, it was made clear that he would receive a very heavy sentence. He wrote to Brezhnev saying, Dear Leonid, you must know, the dissidents are people who truly love our country. At the time, I don't know why, but I thought that Andropov knew what was going on inside the KGB. I wrote to him saying that we had to stop persecuting our citizens who were not criminals. The dissidents only wanted to improve our country and lives. He knowingly took a decision that would destroy his life. He knew that the system would never forgive him. To them he was a traitor who would be severely punished. The dissidents didn't see him as one of them. When he was sent to a camp reserved for traitors to the motherland, no one helped. Even the dissidents quickly forgot about him.
Viktor Orikov is now on a path that leads dissidents to the gulags, essential for redemption and repentance. He serves his sentence in Camp Morki for re-education through labor, where living conditions are deliberately harsh. The electric heating never worked in the barracks. During winter, it only took two days for the walls to be covered with ice 10 to 15 centimeters thick inside the barracks. We often brought a piece of sheet metal into the barracks and lit a fire on top to keep warm. When there weren't many people in camp, we took the extra mattresses, sandwiched ourselves between them and slept in our clothes. The food was horrible, porridge of oats or buckwheat. We also had a soup with cabbage, but there was no meat because the guards routinely stole it. In a month I lost 15 kilograms. A few hundred kilometers from where Viktor Orikov serves his sentence, Mark Morozov is held in camps reserved for political prisoners, first Perm, then Chistopol. Sergei Grigoryans was a very active dissident during the 70s and a friend of Mark Morozov. At Shistopol, he shared a cell with Morozov and was his confidant. Without knowing it, he was also protected by Orikov. For the first time, he returns to where he was imprisoned. In prison, senior KGB officers tried to convince Morozov to write some kind of apology that would be published in a major newspaper. They asked him to confess and write that the CIA and the imperialist world manipulated him, that he damaged the Soviet authority and that he regretted it. The truth was that for us, accepting to write such a confession meant an early release. For Mark, it was a unique opportunity to save his skin. He hesitated. Write or not write, a false confession. The KGB agents who watched over him put more and more pressure on him because they felt Morozov would eventually crack. For the agents, it was important because it would be proof of their effectiveness. In the end, Mark refused to write a confession. A few days later, Mark's cellmates went to the exercise yard. He stayed behind and committed suicide. Many never returned from the gulags. Disease and ill treatment often overcame the Zeks, the name given to gulag prisoners. Sergei was a friend and cellmate of Mark Morozov. This is his first visit to the Zex cemetery where Mark is buried. In Zone 35, there was one hospital for several political prisoner camps. I was brought here from Chistopol prison. Those who died were buried here. There are not many crosses, because most were buried in common graves. 
и то, как к ним относились и относятся, и живым, и мертвым. You can see how prisoners were regarded. They're buried next to a dump. с кладбищем мусорная яма. After eight years in the gulags, Viktor Orekov returns to Moscow. The country is in the midst of perestroika. He finds work in a factory warehouse and tries to start over again and rebuild his life. Times have changed. History proves Orekov right, but it does him no good. The Berlin Wall falls. The Soviet Union breathes its last breath. The KGB is replaced by the FSB, but the men in power stay the same. In February 1991, journalist Igor Gamayunov from Moscow's leading newspaper, Literaturnaya Gazeta, was the first to tell Orakov's story. He surprised me because, coming from the military, he should be a man of discipline with preset ideas. But this man was the opposite. He was a free thinker. He quoted poetry and philosophical text. Of course, I was stunned. I asked him to tell me everything that happened to him. And I wrote the first article. After it was published, I received a phone call from a woman saying, you wrote an article on a certain Orekov, the Orekov who helped dissidents. Yes, I answered, and asked, who are you? We are the dissidents that he helped. We want to see him. Could you give us his phone number, please? I said, of course I'll give it to you even though I shouldn't. First, I'll call him to agree on a venue. We organize to meet near Metro Kropotinskaya. The dissident Kirill Podrabinek, Alexander's brother, had no idea that Viktor Orekov protected him before he was arrested and sent to Siberia in 1978. It's a great surprise when he discovers that his guardian angel is still alive and back in Moscow. He naturally goes to the meeting organized by Igor Gamayunov. Certainly, some of us dissidents felt some guilt. We felt that we owed him a great deal. He risked his life for us, all the while being a stranger. He wasn't one of us, yet he did so much for us. We obviously feel a sense of gratitude. Viktor Orekov and I went to Kopotinskaya to meet the dissidents. There I witnessed a very moving scene. These dissidents who spent a long time in prison, and some who never saw his face, threw themselves at him. We didn't want to touch him as if he was a relic, but we wanted to reach out to this captain, Viktor Orekov. Everyone wanted to see him. There are a lot of people, a crowd gathered around him, and everyone wanted to meet him. For them, he was a myth, a legend, someone who was only a shadow in their lives. But he saved some from arrest and helped others to hide their banned books before a raid. On seeing him for real, they threw themselves at him. And you know, at Kropotinskaya, there was a newsagent window and they literally pressed his back against the window. They touched him and asked him, 
This isn't possible. Is it really you? A new life begins for Victor. A new mission awaits him, this time alongside the dissidents. When they learned that I was still alive and was the KGB agent who had helped them, Sergei Grigoryans called me and said, Victor, we're organizing conferences on the KGB yesterday, today, tomorrow. It's very important. You absolutely have to take part. I started working with them. I was the expert, the consultant, and participated in the conferences as a former KGB officer. And I was asked, is this true? Is that true? Sergei found my work very useful and he put me in charge of lectures on themes such as the KGB and psychiatry or the KGB and dissidents. And sometimes I was sent to defend people on trial as an expert and representative of a civil organization. This situation doesn't please the likes of General Trofimov, Victor's former superior, now second in command of the FSB. General Trofimov was well known among dissidents. This guy is a real son of a bitch. He dealt with dissident cases with an iron fist and Orikov was fighting him head on. He was involved in many political affairs and he investigated Orikov's case. He had no principles and he was very cynical, but also intelligent and very professional. This is why he had a successful career. On May the 10th, 1995, Victor makes a careless mistake. A colleague of mine had a fake gun. In truth, it didn't even look very real. It didn't fire and I had no ammunition. One evening, we set off somewhere and I put it in the car, just in case. It was just for show. The police stopped us. Without thinking, I told them to go ahead and search the car, and they found the gun. They kept me overnight and wrote a report. And the story should have ended there. When it started, Orikov didn't take this story seriously. Of course, he was arrested with a fake gun. But you have to remember that it was during the mid-90s when everyone carried a gun to protect themselves from gangs. When he was arrested, he didn't hide the gun. He thought it would end there. But the story ends differently. Apparently, during their inquiries, they find that Viktor Orekov was the same Orekov who did eight years in the Gulag for helping dissidents during the Soviet era. In 1995, the director of the FSB in Moscow, the successor to the KGB, was General Trofimov. He was Orikov's former colleague and knew of the first case against him perfectly well. And I think he was even in charge of his first conviction. There were rumours circulating that when Trofimov learned that Orikov was the subject of an investigation, he made sure that the case would stay open and end up badly for Orikov. The KGB was taking revenge. This could be revenge by the KGB, but we had to know if he actually owned the gun or if it was planted, which we in the services often did by hiding things in someone's possessions, such as weapons or drugs, followed by arresting them, accusing and condemning them.
On July the 21st, 1995, Viktor Orikov goes to court feeling confident, but on hearing the verdict, he's in shock. He's sentenced to three years' imprisonment in a labor camp for the re-education of repeat offenders. My father called and warned me that Viktor Orikov was arrested. I was on vacation, but I immediately went to Moscow. I learned all about the case details, why it was initiated and how it was heard. We created a group for his defense organized pickets outside the prosecution office. And then we held a meeting where I gave a speech in Viktor Orikov's defense. News of Orikov's arrest spreads throughout the city. His dissident friends are in shock. They mobilize, demonstrate, and set up a committee to support calls for his release. These were methods that the KGB used and still do today. They had every reason to take revenge on Orikov. When they put us dissidents in jail, KGB agents would get stars on their shoulders. But when Orikov betrayed them, they lost all their stars. Of course they hated him. In the meantime, Viktor Orikov serves his sentence at Camp Chelyabinsk in the Urals. It's a hard labor camp for repeat offenders where cruelty and violence are part of daily prison life. No one can see in. It's another society with its own set of special rules. Thanks to the committee's actions and support, plus an appeal to the Supreme Court, Viktor Orikov's sentence is reduced to one year. His early release hits the headlines, and he's a guest on Hero of the Day, a popular Russian television show on NTV. Do you have hope for the future to regain your strength and start a new and normal life? I doubt that I can have a normal life. And in general, you know, I doubt that they'll let me live quietly because, because of what I saw. I can't keep quiet. I couldn't live without saying anything, without denouncing. I want to keep talking about it. This situation scares me. It shouldn't be this way. And of course, sooner or later, I know they'll take revenge. Do you think the people who want to take revenge on you are your former KGB colleagues who you worked with in the 70s? If it's not them directly, they'll do it through others. Everyone told me, Victor, what are you waiting for? They'll kill you and say that it was the street gangs who did it. Everyone insisted that I leave. My mother told me that Trofimov vowed to take revenge and said, I'll get him one way or another. He'll be dead soon. One day, a representative of the U.S. Embassy came to see me. He said that he had information of plans to kill me. There was a contract on my head. We went to the U.S. Embassy, and because I had a release certificate from jail, they issued me a visa within half an hour. On April the 11th, 1997, Viktor Orikov goes into exile in the USA. I find him in the United States, 
a broken man, alone and abandoned by everyone. But despite everything, he has no regrets and insists that if he had to do it again, he would do it without hesitation. He is still consumed by nostalgia. Despite being relatively safe in the United States, he's never found peace or meaning here. I do you order pizza? Yeah, how much? Yeah. Oops. Careful. It's always in health. Oh. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Have, have a good night. night. I can't say that I'm unhappy with my living conditions. I'm unhappy because I'm not doing what I want. I'm not part of anything. I'm like someone who, when you catch a fish, instead of frying it, you put it in a small jar and say, let it rot here until it dies. That's exactly what it feels like here. 